What would you do with unlimited clean energy? I'd do something involving genitals, human waste, or social taboos, because those are the three comedic things. But all you beta male soy boy cucks out there, hi dad, thanks for watching, sir, probably said something like, pull the world back from the brink of apocalyptic climate change, or convert us into a post-need society. Such is the dream behind cold fusion, a mythical non-existent technology that can be nutshelled pretty easily. In nuclear fission, think A-bombs and nuclear reactors, energy is created by shooting electrons at atoms and splitting them apart, which is an incredibly hot process. In fusion, energy is created by pushing atoms together, which also creates a lot of heat. Says who? Oh, I don't know, smart guy. How about the fucking sun? Fusion releases even more energy than fission and way more than fossil fuels. One kilogram of fusion fuel, which can be as simple as deuterium extracted from seawater, could provide as much energy as 10 million kilograms of burning dinosaur goo without producing greenhouse gases or toxic waste. But unfortunately, it's tough to replicate the conditions present on the sun safely here on Earth. So, cold fusion is just like fusion, but if you could do it at room temperature, coolly turning water to lightning, and thereby blowing Jesus' water to wine trick out of the goddamn water. Or should I say, gosh darn lightning. Sorry, Jesus. Now, if that all sounds too good to be true, that's because it just might be. Let's get into the rise and fall of cold fusion. We may as well. We've got time while my zero-point vacuum energy singularity drive spins up. But then I swear, Smash Bros and Hot Pockets, just you and me, Michael Swaim, host of Future Proof, where I nerd out about classic sci-fi tropes and their real-world counterparts. Hello. In our world, the Cold Fusion story really kicks off in 1989 with an experiment by electrochemists Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann. Experiment means thing you say you did but actually didn't, right? Like American democracy and my Canadian girlfriend? Because guess what? The Pons-Fleischmann results are now widely considered a hoax. After a ton of other scientists followed their instructions for creating cold fusion and were like, nah-uh. Nevertheless, the idea stuck and wormed its way into the premises of a bunch of 90s action thrillers like Chain Reaction with Keanu Reeves and Morgan Freeman, or The Saint with a Val Kilmer and Elizabeth Shue, or even more recently, Night and Day, Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz, and Short Fuse with Snippy Bippy and Tom Bobbins. Sorry, must maintain the comedy rule of fours. And while it's not made explicitly clear that the DeLorean in Back to the Future 2 runs on cold fusion, its power source is called a Mr. Fusion and doesn't seem to produce a heat as intense as the sun itself. Then again, the Orange County Register called me Mr. Fusion for my Hawaiian taco truck, and that was really just spam and tortillas. These days, cold fusion as a concept has faded into legend and nonsense, making more modern usage seem like generic sci-fi mysticism, like the cold fusion bomb from Independence Day 2, or the cold fusion device from Star Trek Into Darkness that freezes lava because it's literally cold and fuses things, which is... Gene Roddenberry's doing barrel rolls in his space grave. We've separated the saucer section, and Barclay's in charge of the battle bridge. I mean, we are categorically logic fucked. Star Trek. At least in the new Fallout series, Cold Fusion is presented as an energy source. Although how it transmits its power to the entire wasteland without any kind of related infrastructure is a mystery to me. Of course, in the Fallout universe, radiation poisoning also turns you into an immortal undead cowboy bounty hunter instead of a mortal, near-dead, skin-sloughing cancer patient. Although that would have been a good open-world game, too. Hair Fallout. New lesions. The much worse game, Atomic Heart, bad game. Famously, a cross between Fallout and Bioshock also ripped off the cold fusion aspect. Not satisfied with being quite that derivative, most new properties dropped cold fusion as a plot device around the same time it faded from the scientific spotlight. Small research groups still work on the problem, usually under the name low energy nuclear reactions. But cold fusion is nowadays just one potential alternate energy source among many being pursued. And it's not even the most promising in the short term. That would be chocolate, am I right ladies? 
Meanwhile, fiction moved on to a variety of other popular power sources. The Event Horizon, Romulan Warbirds, and some of the ships from EVE Online all rely on a trapped black hole or singularity to generate power. One presumes by sucking stuff in and then converting that potential energy gradient into electricity, like we do with water falling through a dam. Sorry, Jesus. Water falling through a darn. Another popular one is vacuum energy or zero-point energy, which is dumb as hell because those terms refer to the lowest observable energy levels in the universe, i.e. the energy present in a total vacuum. Trying to tap the mana of space itself is kind of like trying to squeeze blood from a stone stuck in amber frozen in an iceberg. How did amber, traditionally formed by pine resin, get inside a glacier in Antarctica, the only continent on Earth with no pine trees? Cold fusion, bitches. You know, of all the Star Treks, it's funny that Into Darkness is the only one that officially threw out any pretense at being rooted in science and said, screw it. We're going back to inexplicable magic. Dark Ages, here we come. Make America medieval again. Ooh, mama. Better than MAGA. Sexier. There's something inherently sexy about mama. Shoot, I just heard how that sounded. Hi again, Dad. I'll call you after the show so we can devise my punishment. Hashtag alpha male, hashtag Movember, hashtag prostates rule. All that said, there's obviously a ton of alternate energy sources being explored right now because otherwise we'll all die in a hurricane made of forest fires. You'll probably want to get on that, Gen Alpha. We were going to, but a little old housing bubble bubbled up and ruined all of our stupid millennial lives. Hey, we gave you the killers, though! So all, all good? No? Well, that's okay, because human ingenuity is swooping in to save us from the brink of extinction once again. Unless it's already too late, which again, a lot of scientists think it might be. But if it's not, then these new technologies I'm about to describe will be good. Yes. I want to talk about two alternate energy sources in particular that I find exciting. Bacteria and nothing. I know, a classic recipe for excitement. On the bacterial front, scientists at the École Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Switzerland are probably upset with me about how I just pronounced that. They also spliced a bacterium famous for naturally generating electricity with an E. coli strain, resulting in a form of E. coli that has an electron transfer pathway running through the middle of it. The benefit there isn't just that it puts out more power, but that it can now put out power by doing what E. coli does, namely, eat crap. The researchers at EPFL harvested electricity from human waste, meaning the Mr. Fusion in Back to the Future may have had more objectionable things than just garbage in it. No wonder they call him Doc Brown. As for energy from nothing, no, I'm not referring to vacuum energy, nor am I perusing impulse buy items at the gas station checkout counter. I'm talking about hydroelectricity, the concept of deriving power from naturally occurring elements in the air. The more humid, the better. Famed pigeon lover and Jackman cloner Nikola Tesla pursued this technology but never cracked it. And now, a team at Amherst have become the de facto leaders in the field. The idea involves little units of material perforated with thousands of nanopores in such a way that water molecules from the air that pass through them naturally build up a differential charge that can be harnessed. Water molecules in clouds are always passing little shocks of electricity between them. In fact, a lightning strike is just a major imbalance in charge getting worked out like a bookie finally getting fed up and breaking some deadbeat's legs. Now it's looking like we can scrape all those little bits of electricity together, like the weed at the bottom of your grinder when you're out of weed. All right, that's enough similes for a second. <clears throat> As of now, you would need a fridge-sized stack of the little air gen wafers to power an average home. But on the bright side, the devices can be made from a wide variety of cheap materials. And unlike solar panels, they operate 24-7. All they need is some amount of humidity in the air, which admittedly isn't omnipresent, but it's definitely an easier condition to meet than direct sunlight all day. The team is currently working to make air gen wafers smaller, cheaper, and more scalable. Now all we need to do is find a way to convert all those microplastics from our testicles into power and we'll be set. Or again, it's too late already and we're all doomed, but at least when our energy patterns are released from this material plane and converge again as a vibrational sea of pure creation, we can all say, I knew that was going to happen. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on Future Proof. Unless we don't make any more, in which case, probably something else.